You'll see that I have extended the reading from what is in the bulletin this morning. Hear the word of God as it is written in the 20th chapter of John, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Praise God for his word to us from the book of John. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the prayers that envelop this time together. I too pray that it is your word that is spoken here. And I pray that you would help each one of us to understand and take it to heart that our faith in you may grow. Through Jesus I pray. Amen. I'm going to say a word, and I want you to tell me what the opposite of that word is. So you can feel free to shout out. Hot. Day. Black. Fast. Up. Faith. Pardon? Sorry, I can hear. Believe. Believe. Thank you for that. And I don't, uh, all too often, we do consider doubt the opposite of faith. We think that being uncertain, that calling something into question, especially in matters of our spiritual lives, is something that we should never admit to. That that questioning, that that uncertainty is equal to unbelief. Unbelief is flat out rejection of Christ. The opposite of faith in Christ is hearing how the Son of God served as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised from the dead, and rejecting, denying, and even refuting that truth. Atheists deny the existence of God. They do not know the peace that comes with giving God control over your life. They don't doubt God. They reject him. Can you see how doubting is not the opposite of faith? Yes, there may be some uncertainty and some questions, but who 
among us has not wavered in our faith when doubts arise because of difficult circumstances. Our doubts can surface when we are victims of abuse or when we suffer loss, be it the loss of a child, of a spouse, of a marriage, of an ability, or of a job. In our grief and anger and desperation, we might ask God, where is he? Where he is? Why he didn't seem to solve the problem or help the situation. Our prayers seem to go unanswered. The hurt continues. The health deteriorates. The situation is unresolved. It is in these times when we ask why that sometimes doubts arise. And we need to see evidence that God is with us, that he is in control. And if we don't deal with these painful questions, with these circumstantial doubts that plague us when we are in those times of darkness, when we are in those dark valleys, when we are questioning God, we will have a problem. We need to be reminded of verses like Psalm 23. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close to me. When we don't deal with these doubts that arise because of situations that we are in the midst of, they can fester and grow into spiritual unbelief. These spiritual doubts are ones that rock the foundations of our faith. We've got to move on, to let go. When things aren't going according to our plans and prayer doesn't seem to be producing the results that we want, sometimes that doubt morphs and matures to the point where it hardens our hearts and turns both our hearts and minds against God. We distance ourselves from God on an emotional level level because it hurts too much. We shut him out of our hearts and then give power over to doubts raised by books and movies and celebrities that ridicule and attempt to disprove the authority of the scriptures and the divinity of Jesus Christ himself. Perhaps because of anger or pride, we don't turn to the Bible for relief from suffering. If we did, the scripture would remind us how we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character. And character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us when we claim Christ as our Savior. We don't turn to the wisdom of God's word because we're sinful. We do not, we we don't turn to his word. We turn to our ways. We think we know best. We're full of pride. We really feel that we just cannot trust God with our lives. He might make us do things and go places that we don't want to. He might, we might have to change the way we do things. Is 
that what's holding you back from saying, yes, Jesus, you are Lord. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me of my sins and be my savior from now until eternity. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Someone once said that the role of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and if not that I can uh, anyway if this talk about doubt is making you squirm like it's making me feel then there's something in God's word that is speaking to you and I. If anything Talking about doubt should be liberating for all of us. Deep doubt is often the prelude to an even deeper faith. Frederick Butchner describes it this way. He says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it moving. When we look at how Jesus dealt with and treated his disciple that had to see before he believed that Jesus had been resurrected, we'll realize that it was because of Thomas's doubt that his faith grew and matured. Poor old Thomas. Thomas is his, was his Hebrew name, and Didymus, meaning twin, was his Greek name. He has been dubbed Doubting Thomas. And I guess you could say that that's his nickname. I don't know if any of you have ever been given a nickname. I'm not going to share with you what I was called in school. Sometimes nicknames define a specific characteristic of a person or a handle that describes the exact opposite trait that one possesses. I think the Doubting Thomas title is a bit of a misnomer in this disciple situation. Because we see earlier in the 11th chapter of John, we have proof of Thomas's courage and devotion to Christ. When Jesus declares his intention to return to, 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 to Judea and the other disciples try to dissuade him because they know it will mean his death, it's Thomas who urges the others to follow Jesus so that we may die with him. Now, Thomas may not have died with Jesus then, but tra tradition says he labored in Parthia, Persia, and India. And he was killed with a spear as a martyr for his Lord and Savior years later. He was faithful. When the women went to tell all of the disciples in Jesus's, of Jesus' resurrection and his empty tomb, the Bible records that they, Jesus' apostles, did not believe either until they ran over to see it for themselves. As we heard last week, Jesus appeared to the other disciples when they were squirreled away in the locked upper room. And it was then that Christ showed them his wounds. And what is interesting is that in the first verse of our reading this morning, it says that Thomas 
one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came the week before. I wonder what excuse Thomas had for not being with the rest. Did he let other matters take precedence over meeting together with his fellow believers? Or was it just that he was not gripped with the same degree of fear? But it makes me wonder, what excuses do we use in avoiding fellowship with one another? What revelations of Christ do we miss out on or delay because of our inaction or poor choice? Whatever the reason for Thomas's absence, notice what Jesus does. He comes to minister to the disciples once again, a week later, as once more they have themselves locked away in that upper room. Again, Jesus says, peace be with you, to quell their fears, and then he seems to focus on Thomas. It appears that, that the Son of God made a special trip to make sure that Thomas was treated the same as the others. It looks like the Son of God made a special trip to that locked room once again a week later to answer Thomas's doubts and abolish his unbelief and to show him his hand and his side. But that's not the only special trip Christ made. Jesus made a special trip to answer our doubts and abolish our unbelief. Jesus intentionally left heaven to die at the hands of sinners for sinners like you and I. And he is here this morning revealing his love for you. Showing you his pierced hands and his side. So that you would finally let go of your doubt, your fear, and your stubborn refusal to believe in your heart that he died for your transgressions against God. Jesus implores the doubting disciple to stop doubting and believe. If you have questions and doubts, welcome to the club. Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. His desire to receive you as his child, his power to grant you peace, and his unshakable love for you is unchanging and evidenced in his humbling of himself for you and I. Won't you humble yourself at the foot of the cross, saying to Jesus, my Lord and my God, just as that doubting disciple we read about did. A co-worker once told me of a couple who feel they just can't get married until they, they have enough money. Well, guess what? A <laughs> news flash. There's never going to be enough money. <laughs> and if that's your prerequisite for marriage, it's perhaps masking the real stumbling block in that relationship. And in the same way, if you're waiting for all your questions about God to be answered on an intellectual and an emotional plane before you accept him, you've 
got the cart before the horse. Doubt your doubts, not your faith. Act on the faith that you have been given. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for, from yourselves, it is the gift of God. That grain of faith that you and I have been given, though it be the size of a mustard seed, can move mountains. Sometimes it's our doubt that creates those mountains. And if we look at Thomas's situation, we have to admit that he is the one that needs to see in order to believe. And perhaps that characterizes you. Perhaps that characterizes me. I know it's always encouraging to see evidence of Christ among us. But I invite you to look around. It is the love of God that binds us one to another. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. His spirit within us inspires us to care and to pray for one another. You are using your abilities and brute force to fix this building in which we worship. You exercise hospitality by preparing refreshments after the service. You teach and call and visit all because of the love of God. In this morning's text, we have a record of Jesus telling his disciple, because you have seen me, you have believed. Yet, if you were here last week, when we looked at the verses preceding today's selection, you'll remember that Jesus had already showed the other disciples his hands and his side. Remember the verse from Romans that states, there is no partiality with God. This interaction that Christ has with Thomas highlights the fact that Jesus himself makes himself available to those who are fearful and to those who have doubts and to those who need to see proof. Thomas wants to be convinced. He wants proof that what the disciples had witnessed was true and real. And Jesus comes back to that locked room and he offers that again so that Thomas can see. He doesn't reprimand Thomas. He does not refuse to show him what he needs to see. But he does plainly say, stop doubting and believe. Essentially, you have heard, you have seen, and you have felt. Now exercise your faith and step out into it. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to admit our doubts. We've got to admit them to ourselves, to other believers, and to God. Thomas did. He told his fellow disciples that he could not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead unless he saw and touched. We've got to act on it. Thomas listened to the voice of the Redeemer. He was obedient. He reached out to Christ. Hebrews chapter 11 lists the faith of Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Joseph, and so many more that acted on their faith. Thomas had the advantage of literally having God's voice in his ear. For us, we need to turn to his word. We 
might have to go back to it time and time again when we are buffeted by peril and questions. And we need to pray about our doubts. And I put it on a little early. <laughs> but as you can see, faith is work. When the disciples ask Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. That is the work that God gives us. To believe in the one he has sent. Jesus himself equates faith with work. And you know that work is trying. It's tough. And before any of us who profess Christ as our Savior, who don't need to see Christ's hands in his side in order to believe that he's the Son of God who died for our sins and was raised from the dead, before we get all high and mighty and self-righteous and think we have earned the right to shake our heads and our, our fingers at Thomas for needing to see, let us remember that the faith that we do have is a gift from the Lord Almighty. It is a gift from God, the maker and creator of heaven and earth. The last two verses of this chapter of John read, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may live in his name. Hmm, that's kind of a funny thing for God to inspire someone to put in kind of as a footnote. But John, I believe, was indeed inspired by God not to record all the many other signs that Jesus performed because we have enough proof. There is enough proof before us in order for us to believe. Listen, look, see, reach out and touch the risen Christ. May you be blessed because you have not seen and have yet believed.